Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Chandra, and I work <coughs> at the Penticton Museum. And we're here for the brown bag lectures, and they run every Tuesday from about mid-September to the end of uh, March. So we're coming near the end. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, it's one of our regular programs. It's been going for over 30 years. So um, we've been around a long time, and so and it's it's thanks to people like you uh, who who keep coming out and also offering your your um, uh, an opportunity to speak and talk about something that you've been working on, and so that's what we're here today because Viv Miguelgan Liskowski, got it, Elemental P, <laughs> Elemental P, yeah. <laughs> Is, uh, she's going to talk to us about the research she's been doing on her father, who was uh, a part of the Royal Canadian Air Force. And she's going to tell you a lot about that research. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Chandra. You're welcome, Ben. All right. So nice to see everybody here. I see. Thank you. <laughs> see a lot of familiar faces today. It's really nice to see you. So, uh, yeah, I moved to Penticton in, um, with my family in 1966, and I attended Queen's Park and Nicola and Carmi and Maynickel Park, and I graduated from Penn High in 1973. Um, then I went off to UBC for a Bachelor of Ed in Fine Arts and an MED in Counseling Psychology while living and working in the Lower Mainland. And I returned to Penticton in 1993 as Principal of Princess Margaret. I met the love of my life, Dave, and uh, we had our amazing daughter, Heather, and then I retired from the school district in 95. I still do some work for the school district as chair of the local bursary and scholarship foundation. And over the years, I've become an amateur historian, which has brought me to this presentation today. At this time, I'd like to mention that my past, present, and future have been shaped by my time living in Penticton on the traditional lands of the Silakh people. As such, I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for their land that I call home. So I have a story today about my dad, who was with the RCF in World War II. I didn't know much about my dad's time during the war. He rarely, if ever, talked about it. After he passed away in 1998, my mom gave me his flight log book. It's one of the very few things I have from my dad. I treasured it, and I browsed through it over the years, but I never fully delved into it. Then last year, I misplaced it. Despite many hunting expeditions all over our house, I couldn't find it for several months, and I was heartbroken. When it finally turned up in a box in the basement, I was so thrilled to find it, and I immediately photographed all of the pages so I'd have a digital record of it. When doing so, it became the kickstart into a significantly large mountain of research. It all started when I googled one of the words in the logbook that popped out at me. Dakota. From there, I went into all sorts of websites and searched through old family photo albums. Up to that point, I had no idea how a person enlisted, how they were trained, or how they ended up in Europe during World War II. No idea. But as I started to dig into it, I was able to find information that answered some of my questions on 40 months of my dad's life, and then connected the dots between my dad's time during the war years and later on, his years with Canada Post, which brought us to Penticton. So I'll start with a little background. Wes's parents were Minnesota farmers who moved to Saskatchewan in the early 1900s. Dad was born in Admiral in 1924, and shortly after graduating from Assiniboine High School in 1942, he moved with his family to New Westminster. Wes was 18, and he got a job at Fraser Mills in Millardville, near New Westminster, as a crane man. So why would Dad enlist? Well, since he was brand new to BC, it would be questionable as to whether he would have known many young men his age in New Westminster, and any he did know were likely enlisting when they finished high school. Or perhaps he was influenced by his father, Bernard, or his older brother, Myron. Bernard served in both wars, and Myron was serving in the Canadian Armed Forces in Germany. Wes may have also wanted to be a good role model for his younger brother, Ray, a sea cadet, who's in the middle of this photo. Or perhaps it was just because he was influenced by all the discussions of the war and all the inspiring poster art that was found everywhere at that time. In any case, 
Wes enlisted in the RCAF on January 5, 1943, <coughs> at the nearest office in New Westminster. The form included basic information. He listed model airplane building as one of his hobbies that he thought might be useful to the RCAF. And despite the fact that Wes had never been in aircraft prior to his enlistment, he ambitiously selected flying duties on his form as his preference of assignment within the RCAF. Wes probably didn't realize that only a few selected people would be eventually become pilots. And then he waited and waited. Typical of the time following enlistment, Wes was placed on leave with pay for what ended up being about five months. During that time, he received about $1.30 per day along with working at the Fraser Mills while he waited to report for basic training. So a bit more background on how all this worked. At the start of World War II, the United Kingdom was considered an unsuitable location for air training due to the possibility of enemy attack, the strain caused by wartime traffic at airfields, and unpredictable weather. Canada, however, had plenty of room for flight training, good flying weather, and was beyond the reach of enemy forces. So at the start of the war, the British Commonwealth Air Training Program, the BCATP, called upon Canada to train British and other air crews from the Commonwealth, Canadians, Brits, Aussies, New Zealanders, and Newfoundlanders, because Newfoundland wasn't part of Canada until 1949. The BCAT, BCATP was an enormous undertaking. The programs trained pilots, navigators, bomb aimers, wireless operators, air gunners, and flight engineers. As you can see by this flow chart, each of these training programs had multiple levels. Within five years, the BCATP trained more than 131,000 aircrew, more than half of which were with the RCAF, and another 80,000 ground crew. The BCATP was easily one of Canada's top contributions to victory in the Second World War. Ottawa administered the plan and paid most of the costs, which amounted to about $1.5 billion. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt referred to Canada as the world's aerodrome of democracy. As seen in this slide, schools and facilities were set up at 231 locations across Canada. There were 24 existing airfields that were used, but 80 new ones had to be built. Basic training and classroom facilities with dormitories were commandeered from universities, colleges, and other government institutions. These borrowed facilities were augmented with new construction for barracks and other facilities as needed. At its peak, the training programs required more than 10,000 aircraft in Canada and another 100,000 military personnel to administer. This is a massive program. By 1945, the RCAF had grown to be the world's fourth largest air force. Finally, Wes was called up for his basic training at one of the five Manning depots that were stationed across the country. He arrived by train at Manning Depot number three in Edmonton in June 1943, five months after he enlisted. The depot was located where the Edmonton Commonwealth Stadium is today. Wes was joined by 500 other RCAF to start his training, and they were all given the rank of AC2, or AC Ducies, as they were called, which, although sounding kind of impressive, it was actually just the lowest rank of the RCAF to have an insignia. New recruits were issued their first uniform and great coat, boots, socks, and shoes. Recruits were taught how to bathe, shave, iron clothing, spit shine boots, sew buttons, shine floors, clean toilets, and arrange everything they owned in proper order for inspections. They had to do it because their mothers weren't there to help them. <laughs> Trainees were also issued bedding and two blankets. This is a little odd. Blankets were to be taken with them to all their postings until they reached the rank of sergeant. I couldn't find any other uh, information on that. I'm not sure what they used for blankets after that. Now just a quick mention about the hats. The Air Force wears a unique headdress, the wedge cap, simply described in regulations as 
worn on the right side of the head, centered front to back, with the front edge one inch above the right eyebrow. It was adopted during First World War and was based on the Army's field service cap. The hat was dubbed the wedge cap in 1941, and Second World War photos show it being worn at gravity-defying angles. It probably became popular because it was easily stuffed into a pocket when a helmet was donned for flying. Now, over their four- to five-week training period, um, the trainees were also taught how to guard things, count things, clean things, polish things, and paint things, and were told to wash their socks daily and behave themselves. Everyone had their tasks. And they had rules. No cameras, no photography. Both strictly forbidden. That's likely the reason why we have so few candid photos. Take note of the couple of rule breakers in this photo. My dad is on the left, so somebody smuggled in a camera. There were two hours of physical education every day and instruction in marching, rifle drill, foot drill, saluting, and other routines. While in basic training, Wes and part of his military parades, he was part of military parades for visiting politicians, such as the mayor of New York, Fiorello LaGuardia, and Alberta Premier Ernest C. Manning. Although the trainees weren't required to speak or understand any foreign languages, because French wasn't part of our our history at that point, like speaking it um, formally, I thought it was kind of funny that they did take a course on how to decipher British Cockney accents <laughs> so they'd be able to understand them once they were overseas. Recruits continued to earn approximately $1.30 per day, which they could spend in the canteen, or they could pay 10 cents to have their uniforms pressed for them if they didn't want to do it themselves. Near the end of their training, a selection committee started reviewing trainees for placement in the air crew or ground crew stream. Trainees anxiously awaited for their decision because they knew some of them would remain on the ground and never fly. Based on interviews, trainees were divided into two broad categories, pilot or navigator. From there, they determined the other air crew positions. Further interviews narrowed down candidates for specific air crew duties. It was determined that Wes had the attitude, aptitude, and interest in being a wireless operator air gunner. He had an analytical mind, he was a quick learner, and he had an exceedingly calm demeanor. And he looked good in his jaunty wedge hat. I think it's important to note that before World War II, there was very little emphasis on the training of RCAF wireless operators. However, as the war began, there was an urgent need for a great number of specialized, trained wireless operators to be part of air crew, uh, aircraft crews. Wireless operator air gunner candidates went directly to one of the wireless schools, which were later catered across the country. And as you can see on the first page of the logbook at the bottom right here, I'll get my assistant to um, point, uh, oh, he, oh, oh, there we go, right there, thank you. Um, the, um, the dates and the places there helped me to continue my search for more information. So this is the original logbook here. This is what it looks like, and it's, I'm just handling it gently because it's basically falling apart. But anyway, that's the size of the book. Not that size. <laughs> um, it's in a pretty sad state after 80 years, I have to say. But it's been very helpful to find out a lot of information. So. Moving along, the, um, you can see here the yellow highlighted area of the flowchart is the path Wes took for his training to become a wireless operator air gunner. So, off he went to the wireless school number two in Calgary for 28 weeks of wireless training. And it began in August of 43 and was completed in March of 44. He was part of the WAG 76 group of trainees who arrived at the Calgary CPR station, which 100 years later is home to the Alberta Ballet Administration. The trainees marched to the training school uphill about one hour from the train station to the school, which is now the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. This gave them a chance to demonstrate all those marching skills that they had learned in basic training. 
The trainees learned a few things. It was the wireless operator's job to transmit all messages to and from the aircraft to their base using Morse code. This included signaling of lights and flags if needed. The wireless operator had fewer duties than the other crew members as operations were generally conducted in wireless silence. However, he also served as a reserve gunner and addressed any mer minor emergencies in any part of the aircraft, such as if the aircraft got into difficulties, he had to send out positional signals, or if the aircraft had to ditch into the sea, he had to remain at his post to send out a distress signal to improve the crew's chance of being located and rescued. Uh, it's, you have to marvel at the fact that anyone would willingly uh, take on such an assignment. So, on the next photo, um, the one on the far right there, it was a challenge for me, there was nothing on the back of this, my dad's in the top middle. It was a challenge to figure out when this photo on the right was taken. So I used a magnifying glass to focus on their insignias, and then I googled things such as badge with a hand and a lightning bolt in it. Google, Google cooperated well and provided me with an image that matched and the information to go along with it. This confirmed that the photo was taken in Calgary as trainees wore a badge on their right shoulder depicting a hand holding lightning bolt signifying their training in radio operations, and on each of their upper arms a badge of a horizontal two-bladed pro propeller. Now, this may be quite normal information for some of you. I knew none of this, so that's why I'm, I'm, I, you know, I really went into this research. And then small cubicles were constructed in a classroom. Uh, pardon me. Uh, towards the end of their classroom training, each wireless operator was tested in an aircraft simulator. Small cubicles were constructed in a classroom, complete with aircraft wireless equipment that were meant to simulate the restricted working space for wireless operators on an actual aircraft. Each trainee in a cubicle communicated by Morse code with an instructor and in-flight operating conditions and procedures were replicated as much as possible. So, while at wireless school, West finally did his very first flight as a passenger on a Norseman, like the one on the top of the photo. The Norsemen were able to land on unimproved surfaces such as floats, skis, or wheels, and he was on one with wheels. Following the airborne simulator I just mentioned, the wireless operator was assigned to actual airborne training on an aircraft fitted with wireless equipment. They learned from this experience that it was a bit more challenging to send and receive Morse code while airborne than when they were in a stable land-based radio classroom setting. The rookie wireless air operators completed about 18 hours of training on Norse, Fort, and Yale aircrafts over a couple of weeks in February 1944. So imagine the freezing conditions in Calgary during that month of the year. None of these aircraft were in any way similar to the aircraft they would eventually fly in Britain, but at least Wes and his classmates had flight experience. And I'm saying this because in the first course in 1940, recruits never left the classroom to fly in any aircraft until they arrived for training in the UK and were absorbed into RAF bomber squadrons and a high percentage of them were killed in early flying operations due to inexperienced pilot error. They just had no previous training in that. So, graduation from wireless school <coughs> required that the trainees had to be able to do more, 20 or more words per minute in Morse code. Based on a successful flight and classroom experience, West graduated from wireless school in 1944 in March and like his classmates, he was promoted to sergeant. So that's when I don't know what happened, if he got new blankets. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> I hope so, because he was always cold. <laughs> the graduation was held at the Palisades Hotel in Calgary, affectionately known as the Paralyzer Hotel. Apparently the trainees attended a few parties and dances there. And I found the WAG 76 entry um, graduates page with Wes's name on it, at about two in the morning one day, just back up one there, the little red star is. Um, it's not even in alphabetical order. Um, completely by accident, just I was down one of these Google rabbit holes and, while I was researching and all of a sudden my dad's name popped out at me. It was such a nice little surprise to, to find his name in a document. And so then, once he completed that graduation, he was off by train 
to the bombing and gunnery school in Moss Bank, Saskatchewan. And <laughs> my husband said to me, Moss Bank, Saskatchewan? I haven't, don't even have any water there. I said, well, I had a lake, so they trained there. Trainees learned the techniques of aerial machine gun bombery, bombing and photography training. <coughs> Bowling brokes, or bollies, were used for gunnery training. Wes had his first flight on his 20th birthday. Each bolly carried three trainee gunners, each with their own colored rounds of ammunition. Matching holes in a target pulled behind an aircraft with the colors used indicated each trainee's score. Practice bombs gave a puff of smoke by day and a flash by night. For bombing and air-to-ground firing, they used rafts moored in the lake. Different wind and airspeed data would be cranked into the bomb site for run, each run over the target. 40 minutes was allocated for each flight, which is less than it sounds when, when you consider that there were three trainees on board that all had to learn what they were doing. But I do remember my dad saying they were warned not to take aim on any cows they flew over, ever. <laughs> I don't think the farmers in Saskatchewan would have liked that. So, Moving along, the, the weather was poor during Wes's time in Moss Bank, so the trainees received less than 12 hours of flying time, and only two was at night. I'll note here, thankfully, that his logbook entries don't include a single moment of bombing or gunnery use when he was overseas, <laughs> so that was probably a good thing. He received 79.9% on his exam, but I do recall him saying that he always hoped his overseas pilots would have received 100% on their flying examinations. <clears throat> Moss Bank had an abundance of facilities along with an overwhelming infestation of ticks. It was called Tickville by many who were stationed there. However, there was a swimming pool, a bowling alley, a rec hall, several canteens, and a theater along with dinner, dinner dances. They had excellent monthly publication to read, cleverly titled The Target, and the base received more than 2,000 letters and 1,000 parcels a day. The Moss Bank base is now a golf course. Wes graduated from Bomber and Gunnery School on May 5, 1944, ready to start the next level of his training. So now he's been sent off to the OTU at Patricia Bay near Victoria. It took me a while to find Patricia Bay on Google Maps until it dawned on me that the Pat Bay Airport is now the Victoria International Airport. I was looking for a little bay on the island somewhere. This was the third largest air base in Canada at the time. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, it simulated very closely Britain and the uh, Europe ma mainland. Um, at any one time, <clears throat> 3,500 could be enrolled in the operational training programs, which included air crew, air crew, ground crew, and support personnel. This was their last step in their training. Graduates would be posted directly to operational squadrons. During the 10 weeks he was there, he received approximately 56 hours of flying time plus another 24 hours at night to practice wireless operations as part of a full air crew. And he was on a Canso A for all those flights. A Canso was primarily an air training aircraft for long-range maritime patrol missions. And he graduated from the OTU in August 1944. Following that training, he was posted to squadrons for further experiences on the East Coast. Then on to Halifax for the trip overseas. He embarked from Pier 21 in late January 1945 and arrived at a holding area at Bournemouth on England's south coast. It was there that the crews were introduced to wartime life in Britain. The Bournemouth resort beaches were heavily mined and access to them was barred by barbed wire. There were air raid signs, sirens, and blackouts at night. As well as these signs of war, the young Canadians were introduced to another type of hazardous wartime training, English breakfasts, consisting of powdered eggs on a slice of parched toast with a small piece of grease-drenched spam and a side order of Brussels sprouts. This might be why Wes never ate Brussels sprouts. He always said, you can't eat that. From Bournemouth, airmen took trains to their assigned OTU. Wes was posted in Alness, Scotland. It's in the northern part of Scotland, for his final training about 30 minutes north of Inverness. On top of the $1.30 per day, 
he'd been earning, he received an additional 20 cents a day for being stationed overseas. Shortly after arriving, the Alnus crews were invited to a dance in Inverness, arranged by the post office. It was there that he met the love of his life, 21-year-old Iris Russell. In later years, my mother added the pers personal note in Dad's logbook about the meeting, note the little purple arrow, you'll see Mom's handwriting there. <laughs> kind of cute. <laughs> my mom, um, they were, um, pardon me, the happy couple managed to stay connected while Wes was in Aulis before being posted to Ireland for three months. Wes and Iris were engaged in September 1945, six months after their initial meeting, and as my mom often said, we barely knew each other. While at Allness, Dad did about 10 hours on a short Sunderland, a patrol and reconnaissance flying boat. It was considerably larger than any aircraft Wes had been up to on that point. Now, I'm going to include a little bit here about my mom, because it's kind of, she had a, a, an involvement as well. She played a part in the war effort during the 1944 London bombings. She was born and raised in Inverness, the youngest of eight children. Her family lived on social assistance, in social housing, in relative poverty. She left school at 14 for any job that would help with family expenses. She was 16 when the war broke out in 1939. She eventually got a job as a telephonist with the Inverness Post Office. At 21, she spent periods of time in London working at Faraday House as a relief operator during the V1 and V2 London bombings. Faraday House was London's general post office it was the main telephone communication exchange and telephone exchange and nerve center for Britain's wartime overseas communications. The Germans were firing bombs across the English Channel from northern France and the Netherlands for 81 days. The Germans knew the importance of Faraday House and were regularly bombing the area in an attempt to disable Britain's main communication lines. Iris described living in London during the blackouts and hearing bombs exploding in the city and taking shelter in the underground. In fact, when they heard the squealing of the bombs overhead and then the bombs went silent, they knew they had about 12 seconds to find shelter before the bomb reached its target. She described her time there in one word, terrifying. Iris also described the impossible task of trying to maintain telephone communications wearing a full gas mask while bombs shook the building, which was located very near St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul's Cathedral, and you can see the image of the operators here. They're wearing gas masks with their headsets. The plaster would fall from the ceiling around the operators. Fortunately, the Germans weren't able to be accurate in their bombings and were unsuccessful in doing any real damage. The loss of Faraday House would have been a wartime game changer. The letter of thanks you see here was very important to my mother as she kept it until she passed away at the age of 95. She was a strong, independent woman, a force to be reckoned with. So, moving along, my, my parents were married at St. Mary's Church in Inverness, Scotland, January 21st. 1946. And here's a little coincidence. That's actually page 21 of what I'm reading you. They were married on January 21st. I just noticed that. I've had a lot of coincidences on this. Everything was scarce during the war years. The wedding gown was borrowed. Friends and family chipped in their ration cards for cake baking supplies. And roses weren't available, so the bride carried a bouquet of red tulips. I buy red tulips yearly in recognition of their January anniversary. Note the certificate of character here that she had to provide the RCAF with in order to be married, and the publication of notice of marriage, where my mother is described as a spinster, rather antiquated documents at that time, along with a newspaper announcement. There were interesting traditions in the past. So throughout all of this, uh, Wes was posted to the 435th Squadron in Down Antony near Croydon, England, where he stayed for the remainder of his time in the war. My parents lived in married quarters near the base, and they had an outdoor plumbing. 
I remember my mother telling me that many times. Um, be thankful you have a house, she'd say. The squadron was approximately 20 Dakota aircraft. The Dakotas were US DC-3 military transport aircrafts that served in all theaters during World War II. There were 1,980 of them in use. And they became the RAF's main wartime transport aircraft. Wes made his first overseas flight on a Dakota FZ-671, as you can see in the line, in his logbook highlighted in purple. It's also written over here. There's a reason for that. Now here's an amazing fa fun fact. Last September, we were on a visit to the island, and I happened by chance to visit the RCAF Museum in Comox. Turns out the museum has one Dakota in their heritage aircraft collection, which was had the number EZ671 on it, painted on the rear of the aircraft. Wes's first flight was on the FZ671. I was puzzled, as in my research, there were no Dakotas with an E as the first letter. letter. Further on-the-spot Google research confirmed that when the aircraft went through a post-war restoration, the painter was, couldn't quite read it, the FZ-671 was unclear, and, and it was repainted as EZ-671 in error. The research then confirmed that this was the exact same plane that West did his initial training flight on October 15, 1945, when he was first stationed at Down Ampney. 78 years later, after that Dakota flight, I am standing next to that exact aircraft in that photo on the right. I couldn't believe it. It was a 1 in 1980 chance that it would be the aircraft my dad had flown on. And further to that, another coincidence, we stayed at a place in Comox, Comox on Dakota Street. Crazy. Okay, so moving along, there were seven to nine airmen with each aircraft, pilot, navigator, wireless operator, gunners. So there would have been about 150 airmen plus many ground crews in the squadron. Their sole purpose was to support the Canadian Army units who were stationed in Europe, dealing with the after effects of German occupation. There was no heat and little air control in the aircrafts. Dad commented he was always cold and damp, and he referred to there being lots of ups and downs, which always sounded a bit cryptic. The manner in which most aircraft crews came together was quite informal. Airmen were told, that if they could agree amongst themselves that they wanted to form a crew and fly together, the RAF would oblige and crew them up officially. Interesting way of doing that. Most were very young, generally different ranks and nationalities, and they came from different walks of life. However, the men quickly bonded together to form very special, tightly knit crews based on mutual trust, dependence, and shared experiences, both terrifying ones in the air and more um, pleasant ones on the ground. Um, this camaraderie was crucial to maintaining morale and efficiency in the air, and most of them felt that their crew was the best in the squadron. The air crew also formed tight relationships with ground crews, and they trusted their skill sets with aircraft maintenance. Wes and his crew made countless hops across the English Channel to and from Germany, Austria, Holland, France, Belgium, and Czechoslovenska, as he recorded in his logbook. Now, the Dakotas were large. They had enough room on board to park small military vehicles without having to dismantle them. They carried mail, documents, maps, newspapers, money, ammunition, clothing, wireless and photographic equipment, machinery, tank tracks, wheels, fuel, and tractor treads. They transported Red Cross supplies, plasma, injured servicemen, ex-prisoners of war, military personnel, ambassadors, and diplomats. They dropped paratroopers and pulled gliders. Pretty versatile. So, his wing commander at the time when he was there was uh, C.N. McVeigh. It was noted in his summary logbooks. Oh, you're up. Yeah. That's right, sorry, Dave. Uh, today, totaled 189 passengers, mail, freight, and typewriters, including 4,742 pounds of oil paintings. Such and varied are the loads of a Dakota. On December 14, 1945, another entry <coughs> referenced a most notable passenger. On a trip from Buckberg, Germany, the navigator reported 
that one of the passengers included Mr. Pierpoint, the British hangman, and as an aside, Mr. Pierpoint executed between 435 and 600 people during his 25-year career. I'm not sure where you get training to be a hangman. Uh, it's another form of research for me, I guess. During the trip, Mr. Pierpoint described how over the previous day he had hanged the notorious Bergen-Belsen concentration camp guards, often referred to as the beasts and beastesses at Hamlin. The article you see here was just referenced from Google. The women were hanged individually and the men were hanged in pairs, commencing with Fritz Klein and Joseph Kramer. I'm sure it was a gruesome description during that flight and my dad was the wireless operator on the flight transporting Mr. Pierpont point back to England. McVeigh described another issue. Aircraft KG-665 transporting the Honorable Paul Martin Sr., Canadian Secretary of State, who's the Prime, Prime Minister Paul Martin's father, aboarded their land in Abbeville, France when starboard engines failed. A successful landing was made and a substitute aircraft air crew was dispatched to pick up passengers and crew. It was Wes's air crew who flew to Abbeville, participated in aircraft tests of the KG-665, and flew it back to Down Ampney. I'm sure that flight over the open water of the English Channel had to have been a little bit of a nail-biter for them. During his posting there, the squadron lost three aircrafts, six passengers, and three air crew. Some were through crashes at the base due to poor visibility, fog, snow, runway, um, miscalculations, and pilot error. One of these, as you see in the photo at the bottom, happened a week after Wes arrived at Down Ampney. Three of the air crew were killed. It seemed it was a ground, fuel, ground crew fueling error that was the cause of that crash. So, but it's a little wonder that my dad never mentioned the war to us. It must have been terrifying at times. So, homeward bound. April 1946, they'd finished every, all that they needed to do there, and so Wes boarded a Dakota for his journey home to Canada. Iris had to stay behind and wait until August to join him. Flying time was broken up over eight days, <laughs> took them eight days to get back here, um, with hops to Prestwick, Scotland, Reykjavik, Iceland, Goose Bay, Labrador, finally arriving in Rockcliffe, Ontario, Canada both faced by Wes in his logbook. Flight officer Richmond certified Wes's logbook and appears to be the only error in the logbook. Although they arrived in Canada on April 14, 1946, Richmond dated it 1945 instead of 46. He also did the last entry as May 5th in the logbook. Now, they weren't in the habit of having the pilots do the, you know, the, um, certifications in the logbook, so that may be why. It's probably the only few that he did. Wes's crew then probably spent some time together in Canada until May 5th, as it was typical for servicemen to be transferred to the RCAF Manning Depot in Lachine, Quebec, now the Montreal airport, before they were formally discharged. Wes's Fred, friend Bud was one of the few photos that I had that had something of my dad's handwriting on the back. Um, they were pictured together there in allness. He may have been the one to sign that last entry with good luck, Mac, bud. Once back in New Westminster, he then waited three months for his beloved war bride to make the trip across the Atlantic on the RMS Aquitania. And then she traveled from Pier 21 in Halifax across Canada by train. What a leap of faith, you know? It's astonishing to note that 48,000 war brides made that same trek to join their Canadian husbands. Six years later, their daughter Jeline was born in 1952, and three years after that, I arrived on the scene, both born in the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster. Within a year of going overseas, Wes was promoted to a flight sergeant, then to Warrant Officer 2, then Warrant Officer 1. As mentioned, Wes witnessed and or was advised of many air crashes which were happened mid-air on landings in poor weather or due to inexperienced pilot errors or mechanical failures. He did recall a parachute training incident where a recruit had failed to pull his cord during a free fall and perished. When they found him, his jumpsuit was torn in several places on one side. The recruit had panicked during the descent and evidently had been frantically trying to grab the cord on the wrong side of the pack. 
I'm sure that image was forever embedded in his brain. Wes also mentioned that out of the 24 classmates he had, only two returned from the war. It's unclear which training unit he was referring to, but it may have been his WAG classmates that he was with in Calgary, as that was the typical size of a class. Despite all of this, he completed his training and his assigned postings, ending his military career with a good record. He rarely discussed anything he had seen or done while overseas. He became a reservist in the event of any conflict. So the next one is the final record of the paperwork he would have completed when he was discharged. He received one more, he received one month's pay when he was discharged, about $45. He received a $65 clothing allowance and a free train ride home. Now, this little bit in purple here about my dad was what the, tr the uh, interviewer had typed into his report. And when I read that this summer, that was the first time I knew that my dad wanted to be a baker or a pastry chef. And he never followed that dream. I guess the game changer was that the vocational training he needed was in Toronto, and he lived in New Westminster, and I was expected to arrive from into Canada within a couple of months of his return. So as it turned out, he ended up working for the Postal Service instead of the pastry service. <laughs> Quite different. So, so, why enter the Postal Service? Well, I think he was likely influenced by his time in the RCAF. Mail was a lifeline between the home front and over there. The transport missions Wes's crew were involved in always included movement of tons of mail and packages. As a wireless operator, his job was focused on communication. Perhaps that translated into paper communication when he was discharged, as he saw the power of troops receiving mail from home while overseas. Since the only contact with their families was through letters, no wonder mail was so vital. The isolation of being overseas, the hardships, and the homesickness was alleviated only by the presence of a letter from home. He seemed satisfied with his work for the federal government during the war, so knowing my dad and his way of carefully considering all his options, he likely opted for a lifetime career with Canada Post as it offered a steady, predictable, reliable type of work and income. Was his first job was with the new Westminster Post Office. Thanks. As he had no formal post-secondary training, he started out slinging mail bags and sorting and processing mail and parcels. Through dogged determination, he worked his way up, becoming a postal clerk, then moved into administrative positions, landing his first postmaster position in Rossland, and then Prince Rupert, before his appointment as the eighth postmaster in Penticton in 1966, where he remained for 15 years until his retirement. So he was in good company because Tom Ellis was the first postmaster in Penticton. The photo here of my dad, that was taken at the federal building on the corner of Winnipeg and Nanaimo. It made me sad when I saw the windows broken in that building, and that building hasn't been a post office for years. <laughs> in between times, he did specialized admin work in Vic Vancouver, Victoria, and Ottawa, receiving many awards and accolades and he was treated royally by the Aketa postal staff during one of the first Penticton Aketa sister city tours and planted a tree in Aketa. As you can see, Canada Post was not without its challenges, with lots of strikes and bites and postal hikes. The stamps did get prettier, though. You see the one on the left and the one on the right. West was recognized for his expertise and leadership and was noted for the exceptional respect, kindness, and dignity he displayed to his staff, co-workers, friends, and family. He was often described as a gentleman and a gentle man. Throughout his life, he was proud to be a civil servant, and he was a long-serving Rotarian. He served his community and his country well. Now, as an aside, just to give you an idea of what the, some of this research looked like, uh, I'd like to mention how challenging it was to wade through handwritten notes as seen here. It was like a messy word salad of all different handwriting. 
My magnifying glass became my best friend, along with playing guessing games as to what ex everything actually said. So this is a small piece taken from Wes's record that shows his promotions along the way. So that's his shoulder. And so it's just this last piece here. And so the, it matches the insignias on his uniform. The wireless air gunner is on his breast pocket, the Canadian Air Force wings on his shoulder, the crown insignia for a warrant officer, and the chevron of three stripes as a flight sergeant. The other challenge was the log book. The entries are only flight records, so I had to fill in the blanks between dates to create the whole picture. While I was researching, I often felt the same as author David Gran, who wrote Killers of the Flower Moon. He said, I feel like I was chasing history, even as it was slipping away. And finally, Wes and Iris remained together until Wes's passing in 1998. Iris passed away in 2019. They were married 52 years. Their ashes are scattered near Penticton, Rossland, Parksville, and Inverness. I believe they were both part of what is commonly referred to as the greatest generation. So, Dad, if I got any of this wrong, as mentioned at the start, I'm a rookie historian. And yes, Dad, I am still a work in progress. Thank you. Thank you. So in closing, I just want to mention these two stamps, because another coincidence. <laughs> the one on the left is 1939. It's a war memorial in Ottawa, and it depicts troops pulling a gun carriage through the archway. When we lived in Ottawa for summer, we passed by this monument many times. My dad and one of his co-workers thought it would have been much easier if those fellows had just dragged that gun carriage around that arch instead of through it. <laughs> he always laughed at his little joke. And the other final coincidence, the World War I stamp arrived on a piece of mail the same day I did this book for my sister of this story. And it, as you know, it's pretty rare these days to receive mail with actual stamp on it. And it just seemed another major coincidence to receive one with war imagery on it when I was so immersed in my dad's story. So thank you very much. <laughs>